I get to speak to doctors a lot, and what I don't get to do is speak to folks like you, and I think that folks like you have a lot more importance to this country in regard to health than we doctors do because you are the frontline workers, you are the folks who can make a huge difference. And so sorry while I futz with this for a second, and I'm gonna launch right into things because we don't have a lot of time. Um, and I warn you in advance, I am likely going to go over. Uh, but you can start booing me if you decide that you've heard enough. Uh, that's fine with me. I will take a hint, but uh, let's get rolling. And what I want to talk about today is what I call a rebrand. We need to rebrand exercise. You know, exercise right now generally gets presented as something to help with childhood obesity, as something to help with adult obesity, as something to balance diet with. And I am going to spend my time here trying to dissuade those of you who still believe those things from that message. Now, um, we physicians, we put these slides up a lot. I don't know if you guys have to do them, but I have to do them. Um, it's just a disclosure slide. Um, I've got some relationships with non-commercial interests like Ontario's Ministry of Health and then a whole pile of other people. I do have two commercial interests. I wrote a book, which is purchasable, and I own a medical institute, um, and those are my disclosures. None of those matter here because I don't know how to monetize the message that exercise doesn't help people to lose weight. Um, now, what is exercise for? Well, I will start off by reassuring you that I firmly and thoroughly believe that exercise is the single most important modifiable determinant of health. There is nothing that a person could do that would help and benefit their health more than regularly exercising. I also want to make it very clear that I do not debate the fact that the laws of thermodynamics exist, that calories can, in fact, be burned, is true, and that on paper that should affect weight significantly. But I hope to explain over the course of time here that ultimately we can't outrun these forks. These forks are very, very fast. <laughs> now, in terms of exercise in society, and these actually all come out of, well, most of them, a lot of them come from the UK, but these are the sorts of headlines we see, that it's over-policing play that leads to obesity, and that to combat obesity, we need more PE requirements, that exercise could prevent childhood obesity, that not allowing kids to run in the playground is pure madness, and it's because of childhood obesity that's pure madness. I agree that what we have been doing to playgrounds is madness, but not because of childhood obesity. This particular article over here said that th free th fresh thinking around break time play at school will make a real difference. It says here that overweight kids must have better access to sports facilities. Education bosses warn that pupils will buck the obesity trend with exercise. This taught me that netball, something I am not familiar with, I gave this talk in the UK, I learned that playing netball is making our daughters fat. I have three daughters, and thankfully they are not playing netball, I guess, you know, so um, it's all good. Now, what I want to go through with you right now, because I think, and as Doug mentioned, I think evidence is a useful thing. You know, I think truthiness is a lot of fun, and I adore Stephen Colbert, but truthiness is not useful when we're trying to understand what are the drivers now in society. And so I'm going to go through, and I warn you, I am going to go through a lot of studies with you. I will try to make them entertaining and not dry. But I will be going through a lot of numbers, but I will not put them up there. Um, the citations, if you are interested, you can pull the articles yourselves, but I am not going to bore you with slides full of numbers. Now, the question is, can children outrun forks? We're going to start with kids. And this particular study done in 2008 looked at 300 British children between the ages of 5 and 8. They looked at them from 54 different schools for four years' worth of time. What they found was that there was no amount of exercise associated with a change or improvement in body weight or body fat percentage. And when I say no amount of exercise and no association, what this study found actually was that those kids 
who were exercising ten times as much as their peers. They had no protective effect from that exercise on their weight or on their body fat percentage. Now, as far as PE goes, you guys may be familiar with this paper, given what you do. This paper was a Canadian paper done by, at the time, a medical resident, Kevin Harris. And he was looking with his colleagues at the effect of school-based activity interventions on BMI in children. This was a meta-analysis. He looked at 18 different trials in this meta-analysis. They had durations of between six months and three years. They involved over 18,000 students. And what he was looking for was an effect on ch children's obesity rates. What he found was that there was no effect. And this wasn't a one-of. So two more meta-analyses have been published since then. Um, the first one there, from, well, actually the most recent one there from 2015, looked at 47 different randomized control trials from Europe, again on children, and the impact of school-based PE on their weights specifically. And in that first one listed up there, few studies showed any effect on BMI whatsoever. The second study listed there, another randomized control trial meta-analysis, looking at kids between 6 and 12, where the activity interventions were longer than six months. There were 11 interventions, 11,000 students, and again, physical activity interventions were not, not associated with any impact on body weight. And so the question is why? Again, I said before that thermodynamics exist. If kids are moving more, um, this should have an impact, right? We're not sure kids are moving more. So there's this theory, and it's starting to have reproducible results, and it's called the activity stat theory. I don't know if you've heard of that one, but that suggests that somehow inside kids' bodies, and actually maybe adults too, there's something that keeps track of activity, and that when you've exercised, it knows, and then it makes you slow down for the rest of the day. And so the first study that coined this term in 2011 it was a fascinating study. It used accelerometers, so this isn't self-reported exercise, this is objectively measured exercise. And what they were comparing was the impact or the amount of exercise done by kids in three different school settings in England. One was a school that had nine hours. Can you imagine a weekly PE built into the school? The second was a school that was a public school. That first one was a private school, go figure. Um, the second uh, was a public school that had won awards uh, about uh, merit awards for the amount of exercise they included when their facilities, etc. They had 2.2 hours. And the third was an inner city school, had no facilities beyond a concrete schoolyard, and they had 1.8 hours of exercise weekly. What they found, depending on how you want to spin it, was that regardless of the school, over the course of the weeks of study, the kids were all equally active or inactive. It depends on how you want to spin the, the actual findings. But what they found was the kids who were doing more at school did less at home. The kids who were doing less at home did uh, the doing more at school, uh, less at school did more at home. And you know, it really is a, an interesting thing. And it may also spill over into something called NEAT. NEAT is an acronym for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It's fidgeting. And maybe we fidget less. We don't know, but this was a weird finding, and it actually led to a lot of, oh, this can't be real. Um, yet it was reproduced in 2014 in Denmark, and where they have sports schools in Denmark, where the sports school's activities had a minimum of 4.5 4 hours a week of physical activity. Normal schools, so to speak, had 1.5 hours. And again, using objective accelerometry, there was no difference in the activity levels of those kids. And so, you know, again, we are not seeing the impact we are expecting. Now, this picture you might recognize from that newspaper article before, and it's meant to suggest that that boy is sitting down and that his sitting down is the reason why he's struggling with weight versus the other boys who are happily about to climb those ropes. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> looking, at, uh, looking at the study of which came first, the inactivity or the weight? You know, is the weight leading to inactivity? Or is the inactivity leading to the weight? The answer is actually pretty clear. So this study looked at 200 children from 40 schools for 10 years, again with accelerometers. 
And what they found was that body fat percentage and weight, they were predictive of changes in physical activity over three years. But physical activity was not predictive of weight. What that means is, is and this is not surprising either, the kids and adults who struggle more with weight move less because it's difficult to move more with that weight. And especially the kids. I work with parents of children who struggle with weight. And, you know, they really are, the kids, they are embarrassed and shy when they struggle with their weight to exercise in front of their peers. And so their inactivity is not the cause of their weight, but rather the other way around. And so looking at adults, the question becomes, can we, are, as adults, fix this problem? And so looking at an 11-year period of men who exercised more than the recommended daily amounts, what we found was that, in fact, yes, over 11 years, if you exercise more than 150 minutes weekly, you gain 0.4 pounds less a year. Now, you're still gaining, but you're gaining 0.4 pounds less a year. What it means is the men in this study who reported exercising more than 150 minutes a week over an 11-year period of time gained 12 and a half pounds. Those who, who said they did no exercise also gained, and they gained 16 pounds. And so exercise more than the daily recommended amount, and you can gain four pounds less over an 11-year period if you're a man. What's amazing, though, is how this was spun. This is from the same journal article that said, do everything you're told to do and more, and you will gain 0.4 fewer pounds a year. And it says, these recommendations, we should be encouraging people to exercise more for their weight. And then, of course, that's how the media spins this as well. And so I would argue, and I will argue over time, that <laughs> that is not a realistic amount of exercise. So I guess the question is, for us as adults, you know, could it be that we're lazier in our day-to-day? -day? So now let's forget about exercise. Maybe we've just slowed down. You know, there's elevators and there's escalators and dishwashers and you can walk your dog in your car. Um, you know, maybe we've just slowed down. And we actually have answers to that question too. So there's a, something called doubly labeled water. It's a radioactive uh, method of determining actual energy expenditure over a course of a day. And so it is, again, objective. Objectivity is important because when people ask, you know, how much do you exercise, we always say more, just like we always end up taller and lighter than we actually are when someone asks us. Um, so doubly labeled water is objective. And what was, what's interesting is we've had this methodology for a while. And so in the 80s, both in Holland and in America, um, doubly labeled water experiments were conducted to determine what was the average calorie burn among individuals. Those numbers were repeated in the early 2000s. And in that time period between the early 80s and the early 2000s, obesity rates in both countries rose very, very dramatically. What they found was what did not change at all was energy expenditures. And leading those authors, of course, to say that, you know, energy expenditure hasn't declined, and therefore that doesn't explain why we are gaining weight. We have not slowed down. We are burning as much as we always burned, at least between 1980 and 2005. But maybe we slowed down and we're just, it's a slow gain, right? And so researchers also looked at the third world, where perhaps all of those energy-saving things don't exist. And they compared the energy expenditures of subsistence farmers in Nigeria, women specifically, um, and this is a picture according to Google of a farmer from Nigeria, um, and what they did was they compared them to urban Chicago women, 50% of who were unemployed. And they followed the women for three years looking at their energy expenditures to see if there was a difference. And I saw this research presented before it got published and the authors were flabbergasted. They did not expect their findings, but they found we are burning, or at least urban Chicago women are burning, the same number of calories as these women in subsistence farming Nigeria, which again is a very surprising result. But science is not a body of facts. Science is a growing, living, breathing organism of its own, and so we see these results and we want to study more. 
And so once we saw that there was no difference in energy expenditure, a follow-up study looked at whether or not there was any impact of the energy expenditures measured on weight gain over the course of the next three years of the study, and the answer was no. But maybe it was a one of. Maybe it was just this weird happenstance finding where they got, you know, the subsistence farmers in Nigeria who had the easiest job and somehow all those urban Chicago women were crossfitters in their spare time. Who knows? Um, and so another study was done, and this was a massive, massive meta-analysis that I am so happy I wasn't involved in, um, of 98 different studies that used, again, doubly labeled water. That is that objective measurement I was talking about. It had 183 different cohorts of people, 5,000 subjects, and it included studies from 14 different countries, including countries like Nigeria, with low or middle human development index. And as you already are imagining, given the tenor of what I've been telling you, there was, again, no difference. There was no difference. And this is an unexpected result, but just because it's unexpected doesn't make it wrong. This is objective measurements, and I know instinctively, me too, we have slowed down. Like, we have, I know that, but yet these studies, which again are objective, say, well, we actually haven't as much as we think. But put aside all that, let's say we did slow down, we're, we're, we are doing less, um, again, for the adults. Can we disco sweat it all away, you know? Can we just make this better through exercise? Can we, can we balance? Can we balance the energy that we're consuming? Clearly, it must be an energy intake problem, right? Because if we haven't slowed down at all, we're eating more. So can we, can we, can we burn it off? And actually, in theory, as I mentioned, thermodynamics work. The answer is actually yes. And so Bob Ross, anybody here know who Bob Ross is? Bob? No? Bob's actually a really important guy. He's a researcher in Canada. Um, he, he works out of Queens, and he is heavily involved in understanding exercise. And he did a brilliant paper where he got 52 men with obesity, and he randomly assigned them to either a diet-only group or an exercise-only group, where what he was aiming to do in a laboratory setting was make sure that the diet-only group and the exercise group had the same calorie difference, meaning that the diet-only group ate 500 calories less a day, the exercise-only group burned this many more calories a day, and it was equivalent. And he was mean. He had TAs watching people on his treadmill and yelling at them if their Mets were below what they were supposed to be. And he had food diaries and was checking them on a regular basis. This was a hardcore experiment. And he actually proved that, yes, the laws of thermodynamics do work. And, yes, you can balance things. The problem is, and this isn't actually Bob's lab, but it might as well be, but we don't live in laboratories. We live in the real world, and the real world is a very different world. People don't, like Bob study, keep food diaries. People don't understand energy balance. I'm going to get more into that in a little bit. And people often will eat because they exercised. You know, sometimes because we feel we earned it. Um, I, I know I feel I earned my extra beer or whatever I might want when I exercise more. Um, and sometimes because we've been fed a bill of goods that say we need to, we need to refuel, we need to recover, um, which I, I don't think is actually true. Uh, but we do eat because we exercise fairly regularly. So what happens outside of Bob's lab? What happens in the real world? So this was a study done out of Holland. 5,000 adults monitored for 10 years looking again at the impact of weight and exercise, and specifically on what happens if during that 10-year period of time you report that you markedly increased your activity levels. Over the decade, those people who reported markedly increasing their exercise from the start of the study through to the end of the study, after 10 years, weighed 1.2 pounds less, and had one-fifth of an inch smaller waist circumference. And what was the conclusion in the study? I will read you the conclusion of that finding. The authors concluded, these findings support the need for public health programs that promote physical activity. 
No, they don't. You know, these findings do not suggest that we promote physical activity to prevent weight gain, since it didn't really prevent any weight gain. 1.2 pounds in a decade, that is not sellable. Now, let's go to a JAMA study from 34,000 women from the Nurses' Health Study, monitored for 13 years, looking again at the impact of exercise on weight. There were women who did not gain. 13% of the subjects in this study did not gain. They were women who at the study's outset had a healthy body weight and already reported exercising more than an hour every single day. These are rare people. Of those women who did not have a healthy body weight at the start of this 13-year study, there was no amount of exercise that prevented gain over that 13-year period. No amount of exercise. Looking at men, this is 3,500 adults followed for 20 years. Men who exercised a minimum of five hours a week, and five hours a week, it's a lot of exercise. You know, I exercise a lot, but I don't exercise five hours a week. That is a lot of exercise, but men, who exercised a minimum of five hours a week, so it included men exercising more than that, over 20 years, and you'll, I'll stress this word, gained 5.7 fewer pounds and had a 1.22 smaller inch waist than men exercising less than 90 minutes a week. That is not good. Um, put it another way, if you exercise an hour a day, Six days a week, if you're a man, you will gain, gain 4.5 fewer ounces a year. <laughs> and so what was the conclusion of the authors of this study? The conclusion was, our results reinforce the role of physical activity in minimizing weight gain. <laughs> Again, no, no, they really didn't. But go figure how this was presented to the public, which is an important piece. Well, how about walking? You know, everybody talks about walking their weight away, and plenty of people have lost weight when they've undertaken walking programs. Um, but what about walking programs that don't involve dietary change? That was the question. And so there was a study looking at walking programs that didn't include dietary change. For every 10 and a half extra miles walked, you might expect to lose just over a tenth of a pound, according to this particular study. Um, roughly 30 to 37 hours of walking will affect a one pound weight loss, according to this study, which as you might imagine was promoted as a useful tool for weight loss. Um, this study, and I would love to know how they managed to get the adherence of this study, it was 200 people with obesity who were explicitly asked not to change their diets and then exercise an hour a day, six days a week for a year. The men averaged 6.16 hours a week of exercise. The women averaged 4.9 hours a week of exercise. It was an awesome, awesome adherence, an awesome study. Over the course of a year of 6.16 hours a week of exercise, men lost 3.5 pounds, women lost 2.6 pounds. It took 91 hours for a man or a woman of exercise to lose a pound. It's a lot of exercise. And I'm really, I've almost done beating this to death, but uh, bear with me. <laughs> this was John Jakichik's study. John Jakichik, this is the Rolls Royce of exercise studies. John Jakichik is one of the world's foremost researchers in this field. He took 250 um, sedentary people with overweight or obesity and randomly assigned them to three different exercise interventions. There was self-help, you should exercise, here's a pamphlet, see you later. Um, then there was prescriptive amounts of exercise, 150 minutes a week or 300 minutes a week, and it was supervised with weekly contact, there were phone calls, uh, there was encouragement, there was on-site fitness facilities. This was a really good intervention. What was really heartening, actually, and truly, I'm not, this is not sarcasm, um, the self-help, just you should exercise more, actually led to an average increase of 75 minutes a week of exercise, which I find staggering. I wonder what that pamphlet was. Um, <laughs> the people who were asked to exercise 150 minutes a week actually exercised less than the pamphlet people. They did 66 minutes a week. 
The folks who were asked to do 300 minutes a week did 155. Um, despite an 18-month significant increase in exercise for all subjects, 73% either stayed the same weight or gained weight. Only 27% lost more than 3% of their weight. And of those losing more, if you actually looked at the study, they were eating better. And so it gets worse. Um, exercise definitely seems to keep the weight off. So here I'm telling you, it is not going to help anybody lose, but yet it would seem to keep the weight off. Folks who exercise more are, are much more likely to maintain their weight losses. But again, if you look, and I, sorry, I didn't put a, a reference for this one, but it is a study as well, it's 200 women. Um, if you actually look at the study more carefully, which again was promoted as uh, exercise is the ticket to the weight loss express study, Turns out that, yes, the people who were exercising more, um, they did lose, uh, kept their weight off a bit better. But their dietary changes were triple the caloric difference of their exercise changes. So, they, yeah, they were burning a little bit more, but they were eating a whole heck of a lot less. And so, what about just in terms of exercise and the impact on things like body fat percentage? Well, again, there are some studies and there's some guidelines, and this particular guideline says women uh, require 60 minutes of moderate intensity. Moderate. This isn't strolling. Moderate intensity exercise every day to avoid gain. And, of course, the, this means, according to the study authors, that we should be increasing our recommendations to exercise. Of course, adults who follow exercise guidelines still gain weight. That was the finding of that last study. This was the report from Reuters. The study clearly shows we gain weight over time. If we want to slow the gain in weight, we need to increase the physical activity. It's a lot of activity. And what about weight training? Uh, will weight training help? You know, we talked a lot about aerobics. We talked about what was specifically weight training? As you might imagine, the answer is no, it didn't help. Uh, 10,500 uh, doctors in the U.S. Uh, health professionals follow-up study. After 12 years of weight training, those who report the most weight training, more than 25 minutes a day of weight training, after adjusting for everything over 12 years, gained 0.45 kilograms less than the people who reported doing no weight training whatsoever. And what was the conclusion? Weight training had the strongest association with less, less waist circumference increase. Less weight circumference increase. You will gain less weight and have a slightly smaller waist if you exercise a whole heck of a lot. Again, not a particularly good selling point. And so from an exercise perspective, and that's pretty much the end of all the numbers, uh, thankfully. From an exercise perspective, there is simply no realistically, realistically prescribable amount of exercise that will help people stop gaining weight, let alone help them to lose. And what is the message out there? And I apologize for showing you this next GIF because it's a colleague of yours that at least I feel is rather loathsome. Um, this is uh, Jillian Michaels. Uh, I say colleague very loosely, please don't be mad at me. Uh, but this is the message, right? So the message is, you need to exercise like stink if you want to help manage your weight. And this is a message that we promote too, not just uh, you know, from ridiculous television shows like The Biggest Loser. This was on the back of a bus in the city of Ottawa saying that if you sit less, you can have more giant mocha frappuccinos at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> But you guys know that that's not true. I mean, the calories involved in that mocha frappuccino are not going to be balanced by your little bit more cycling to work. Step jockey is something that was built by the national health system in the UK. It's really cool. It gamifies walking up and down stairwells across the city. It's very neat. Um, but of course, it says it's for BMI reduction and for weight loss primarily. Um, this is from Weight Watchers that says when you start to move more, you can earn activity points so you can eat more. The bigger, the further you go, the bigger the Sunday is the message from this ad. And again, we all live it. Anybody who does distance running knows that this is true, um, but it's not actually useful from weight management. 
We've got pie runs. This is, and there's lots of pie runs. This one, what is from Edmonton, where again we are teaching we should reward exercise, in this case, with pie. This is a, a lad who was at a track meet from his school. That is the junk food smorgasbord buffet behind him that again was being encouraged as either healthful or important. Uh, we know, I've got three little girls, if one of my kids so much as bends a blade of grass, someone comes running at them to give them ice cream or a sport beverage. Um, <laughs> We've got these milk ads, right, that talk about chocolate milk, how we need to refuel with chocolate milk. And it is true that the macronutrient breakdown of chocolate milk is the one that seems to be idealized for um, health in elite athletes. But, you know, the likelihood of you having even one student who is requiring this, um, for, that this will help them with either recovering or... The, it's zero almost, like truly... Um, and then, of course, the food industry loves this message, right? So Indra Nooyi, the CEO of Pepsi, there's no question that sedentary lifestyles have caused the obesity crisis to spin out of control. Yet we were talking before how we burn the same as we always burned. But if consumers exercise did what they had to do, exercise wouldn't exist. And this is an important message for the food industry, right? Because this message, well, this message means that you can eat all their crappy products so long as you exercise. It's not our fault. It's your fault for not exercising. And, you know, this balanced lifestyle thing, it's real. Here's Coca-Cola has got an active balanced lifestyle. McDonald's has a balanced active lifestyle. General Mills is a balanced and healthy lifestyle. PepsiCo, a balanced lifestyle. Unilever, a balanced diet and lifestyle. Mars, a well-balanced lifestyle. Nestle, a balanced lifestyle. Balance, balance, balance. You can balance everything according to the food industry. This is a curriculum that's being taught, I hope not in Canada, but it's in over 50% of elementary schools in the States. It's called Energy Balance 101. It was literally designed by the food industry, and it's in 53% of schools. This was one of the things that it tells people to do. When you know you'll be eating lots of treats at a birthday party, the right answer is get a little extra exercise. It's in 53% of schools. This is the four commitments to fight overweight and obesity in a sedentary lifestyle Coca-Cola. Yeah, let's learn about those commitments. Balance matters. That's our commitment. We need to balance everything. Coca-Cola launches free fitness classes, part of 20 million pound obesity drive. They're really helping us, aren't they, guys? You know, they're helping us to exercise more. It's terrific. And what is that exercise all about for them? Marketing. This is marketing. They actually have a VP of sports marketing. That's the title of the person at this place. This race for this little child, which they can get away with because it's sport, is marketing. They're tying the emotions associated with races, joy, happiness, competition, pride, to Coca-Cola. We know these things work. You know, these are real pictures. You know, we've got partnerships, again, built off of this premise. This is with Konami. And the American Diabetes Association, they partnered together to ruin people's gyms by putting these things into them and <laughs> suggesting this is exercise. This is horrifying. Um, you've got American Heart Association with Fuel Up to Play 60. You guys know this program? I mean, I know it's American, but you know what Fueling Up to Play 60 is about? It's about chocolate milk. It's about selling chocolate milk. That is what the program is all about. It's part of Let's Move. You know, it's craziness. And, you know, these are large glasses of chocolate milk. And I don't even think these children moved, right? Like, you know, we've got this here, too. We've got now the Nesquik post-game refueling. Um, run, jump, throw. The, the, the logo for run, jump, throw is now actually Hershey Kisses. Like, that is the new logo. I'm not even making it up. It's the logo. And run, jump, throw is part of Athletics Canada. And so what happens at these sorts of events? So here's the Hershey track and field games, also sponsored by Athletics Canada. It's the good guys, right? What happens at their track and field events? That This is like the, the grand finale event. It's craziness. 
McDonald's has their version as well. I don't remember what it's called, but they've got their version with track and field. We've got Atomic Hockey. It looks like Mr. Landon left, which is a shame because I was going to encourage him directly to try to outbid and outbuy the food industry's purchase of sport from our children. And I realize we do need money, we do need sponsorship support, but should we really be selling it on the backs of our children's health and the promotion of these sorts of products? You guys know what these are, right? <laughs> these are Timbits. Guess what Timbits really owns? Timbits own sports. I mean, I'm thrilled that Canadian Tire is involved in sport, but we got to get Canadian Tire's logo on this rather than Timbits. Everybody's got Timbits minor hockey, but did you know there was Timbits soccer, Timbits ringette, Timbits curling, Timbits football Timbits, t volleyball Timbits, beach volleyball Timbits. Um, this is Timbits lacrosse. I couldn't find the pretty logo. I'll keep looking. This is Timbits softball. Um, and this is... <laughs> From the old days when people actually told the truth, this is what this is all about, right? It's Timbit's time. This is what it's all about. And now they have this new program where if your kid's involved in Timbit's hockey or soccer, you get this little doodad to put on the jersey. And then if you show up at Tim Hortons, you can get yourself an I Just Played I'm Thirsty reward. The I Just Played I'm Thirsty award is a, either a lemonade or a hot chocolate chock full of lots of calories and whole piles of sugar. If you have kids playing hockey and they don't have penalties, they get free french fries. Um, and we know that this actually has an impact in Australia. Kids are seeing an average, I think I, I, it was either four to six hours, sorry, I'll come and have a peek. So four hours a week of brand exposure through the purchase of sport by junk food companies. We got Coca-Cola Family Field Day. This is with the American Car College of Cardiology. And this is from their website where you can balance your calories with physical activity. That's a really fast fork. It's a really fast fork. And there's a problem with this message that we give all the time. This was floating around the Twitter, Twitter feeds last week or two weeks ago. If we keep tying exercise to calorie burn, if we keep tying it to weight, is there a risk to that? I think the answer is yes. So first of all, and these are adults, we know that the vast majority of adults believe that exercise is a very effective way to lose weight. It's just not a very effective way to lose weight. I mean, exercise is a very effective way to be healthy. It helps everything. I mean, everything. Our sleep, our moods, our, 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 our metabolic processes. It affects our energy. It affects our attitudes. It is the single best drug ever but it is not a weight loss drug. And then what happens if someone thinks it's a weight loss drug and they start exercising? They get discouraged and they stop. We need to tell the truth. There's nothing wrong with telling the truth. The truth is exercise and food, well, the balance is unfair. You guys are educators. It's like there's an exam where 80, 90% of the material is the first semester and only 10, 20% is the second semester, telling people to only study for the second semester is not fair. They are not going to get a good grade. We need to tell the truth. We need to take this away from exercise by continually tying exercise to weight control, weight loss, weight maintenance, weight whatever. By doing that, we do two disservices. We do a disservice to exercise, because people won't realize the unbelievable benefits are worth having regardless of weight. And we do a disservice to weight management because people are going to try stupid things when they fail with the thing that they are told is supposed to help them. So I'm sorry for going over. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>